what? You know, you're going to heaven. And instead, this man is weeping over his sins. Amazing. And that's the way we are all to be. And when we're truly weeping over our own sins and our own failings and our own shortcomings and asking for God's mercy, we, we in turn become more merciful to those who are struggling around us. I had a dispute with a priest friend of mine in the Seattle area. We get college, uh, college students come to the monastery regularly. And uh, a good many of them are introduced to the monastery by their professors. And there was a professor that came from Pacific Lutheran University. And, I'm, and because I used to teach psychology, I'm always interested in what, the, uh, what their majors are. So I'm asking, as the students are coming out into the plaza after a service, I'm asking them individually, what is your major? And uh, this young man said, I'm going to be a Lutheran minister. And I said, no, you're not. And he looked at me. What do you mean? You've tasted orthodoxy. <laughs> you can relate to that. And so, in less than a year, there was this young man who came on a retreat. And one of the monks came up to me and he said, you know who that is, don't you? And I said, no. He says, that's the young man that you said was not going to be a Lutheran minister that he had tasted orthodoxy. Well, he's now orthodox. <laughs> he had a beard and he had longish hair and he completely looked different. But he's now orthodox. And uh, he had thrown himself into orthodoxy to the degree that he was planning on uh, going to Holy Cross Seminary. He was a junior in college at, at, at uh, Pacific Lutheran, and he was going to go to, uh, after graduation, he was going to go to Holy Cross Seminary and be a priest. And, uh, and he was so into the, the, everything in the, in the parish that he was elected to the uh, parish council. And, uh, and so he was, um, become, he was chosen to be the secretary for the parish council. So during a parish council meeting, he had his MacBook Air open, which is the kind of computer I have. <laughs> and he had it open, and the parish council president noticed that he had uh, the marijuana initiative, pro-marijuana initiative sticker on there. And he had the equal, uh, the equal sticker for equal rights for same-sex marriage on his laptop. So the parish council said, member uh, council president said, why do you have that there? And Tikhon said, well, I'm for equal rights for everybody and I'm, you know, and I believe that marijuana should be legalized. Well, you know, the priest sided with the parish council president, ended the meeting and kept Tikhon afterwards and, and, and confronted him, you cannot believe these things. And Tikhon, who is a very young, a man, a young man of integrity, isn't gonna he could have easily said, oh yeah, you're right, Father, I'm sorry, I, I agree with you. But he didn't. He said, well, I'm sorry, but this is what I feel. This is what I believe. So the priest removed him from the parish council and banned him from communion. I didn't hear about this from Tikhon. I heard about it from two professors on the campus who were really upset enough to call me. What's with it in your Orthodox Church that you would do this? And then make it even worse, they took away his scholarship from the parish. So here he's facing his senior year and they've taken away a goodly amount of money that he had was dependent on. And when I found out about this from these professors, I called him. He wouldn't return my calls. I emailed him, he wouldn't return my emails. He didn't want anything to do with orthodoxy. 
And finally, one day, he did respond. And he and his fiance came to the monastery to talk to me. Now, he wasn't gay, so it wasn't about that. It was about this liberal education he was getting at Pacific Lutheran. And it was about his, his strongly held belief that everyone should have equal rights in every way. I told him that his greatest sin was putting stickers on a MacBook Air. <laughs> we don't do that. A PC maybe, but not a MacBook Air. <laughs> and meanwhile, I talked to two priests in Seattle, and I, and I, who, both Greeks, by the way, and I said, and they both said, well, tell them we would welcome them. So here's his, his fiance, who's on her journey to become Orthodox, and her future husband have decided they don't want anything to do with Orthodoxy. And these other priests agreed with me that the church changes us. Let's give it a chance. It would be like having somebody walk into a cancer ward. You'll appreciate this doctor. A cancer ward. They come into a cancer ward and, and they have uh, their first treatment. And then they come back for follow-up and the cancer is still there. Well, sorry. Get out. That's not what the church is about. The church is a hospital for the soul. And the priests are to be the therapists. This is pure Hero Metropolitan Herothios Flacos, and it's pure orthodoxy. That, that we are the, we are the, uh, the purveyors of, of the healing process that takes place within the life of the hospital of the soul. It's not a club. It's not like rotary. It's not, it's not about signing on the dotted line on everything. It's about coming to a place for healing. And, and in turn, as, as we are being healed, you know, it's said of the, uh, Herothius Vlachos said this, that, that um, the therapist, the priests, first sought therapy and then become the therapists. And I think that's true. It's certainly that case with me. And I'm a far better psychologist as an Orthodox priest than I ever was in my previous life. Because of that image of, 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 of the church uh, of, of Orthodox psychotherapy that, that Herothius Vlachos wrote about in his book, uh, Orthodox Psychotherapy. It, you know, it, it, it is a remarkable place we are. I was talking to a priest some months ago who was very discouraged and he came to me and he said, I just don't know whether I want to remain a priest. Uh, I'm not sure I even want to remain Orthodox. I'm just discouraged. I see such a mess around me of the way people treat each other, the way bishops treat their priests, the way priests treat each other. It, it, you know, where's Christ in all this? Why am, why am I bothering? Well, I related to that because there was a time when I, was, when I turned 50, which seems so long ago, <laughs> and, and I went through my own kind of crisis of faith. And I thought, good heavens, I could be a well-heeled psychologist in Portland, Oregon now, and instead I'm a destitute monk who doesn't even know whether I'm doing the right thing with my life and maybe there's no God and look at my bishop and look at this and look at that and think, oh, my, what have I done? What have I done? But I believe with all my heart that every single one of us has to confront unbelief. The possibility there's nothing to this 
that there's no God in order to make it real for us. Because I remember a, I had a, a couple came to me about six years ago and they were, oh my gosh, our daughter, is, our middle daughter has just announced that she's an atheist. And it got worse. And transgender. <laughs> and they were freaked out. And they, their, their solution to the problem was to tell her that she's no longer welcome in their home and that she can't come to Christmas uh, at their house because they don't want her influence on her siblings. And I said, that is the worst thing you can do. As, an Orthodox, as Orthodox parents, you are obliged to love your child. And I said, the seeds of Orthodoxy have been planted and she'll be all right. Just let her be and let the, the love of Christ reign in your lives as her parents. They didn't take my advice. And I really believe that she would still be Orthodox today if it hadn't been for their treatment of their daughter. So all of us have to be careful on how we are. If we want, to be, if, if we want other people to be forgiving our sins and trespasses, and if we want ultimately God to forgive us, we have to be quick to forgive. And many of the early fathers, the desert fathers especially, put this emphasis that we're going to be safe when we stand before the judgment throne of God if we have loved our neighbor and been quick to forgive. Loved our neighbor and been quick to forgive. And when we're quick to forgive and we are filled with love, everything around us changes. Saint Seraphim of Sarov said, if you, if you save your soul or if you acquire the Holy Spirit or inner peace, a thousand around you will be saved. And it's true. I have to tell you that by following this sort of philosophy of, of, of Christian living, it's transformed my whole image of things. I, you will appreciate this. When I'm lying there, and they're about to do my first cardiac, you know, my cardio version, which, you know, they, they stop your heart and then they, you know, zap it, you know, and you're like this and all that, you know. Well, I know all this because I've seen it done in aid cars. It's not a pretty sight. And uh, so I'm lying in the cardiologist's unit on my back and the, the cardiologist who at the time is, was, this was my first one, he was Roman Catholic and, and the, uh, the technician who's going to actually do the murdering and, uh, <laughs> and the a cardiac nurse, they're all standing there uh, with smiles on their faces. And I, and I looked at them and I said, I want you to know that I forgive you who are about to kill me. And then I turned to the cardiologist. This is moments before I'm about to go under. I turned to the cardiologist and I said, and doctor, I want you to notice the proper way to make the sign of the Holy Cross. <laughs> and I said, as a cardiologist, you will have noticed that we Orthodox end over the heart. And then I was out, the lights were off when I woke up, it was already done and it was, a, it was not a success. But I've been doing that. I've had 10 cardi cardioversions since then. The last one, hopefully, is, is working. But I also, when I was having my last thing, just the day before I was being released, and they, they put that tube that goes into your heart. What do you call that? Catheter. Yeah, well, they did that. Well, I'm in this room, and it's very futuristic, and, you know, I'm on this slab, and all these masked people are surrounding me. And, and I said, uh, I'm leaving for Detroit in two days. And I don't want to come back in the trunk of a Studebaker. <laughs> so I hope you can make this thing work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
And then I, as I was being, uh, uh, two days before I was to be finally released, I ordered a $75 bouquet of flowers delivered to the nurses and the staff. And one of the male nurses comes into my room and says, Oh, Father, look, somebody sent you flowers. And I said, read the card. <laughs> it's not to me, it's from me to all of you. But, but it, again, it's incarnational that I wanted those people to know how much I appreciated how they took care of me. And most of the time, people in that profession don't get thanked. People are gone, and that's it. They don't think of them. The last time I did that was at, uh, at another hospital in Tacoma. And I, and I show up two weeks after I'd been there, and I bought some flowers and I'm walking down these long corridors and, and I'm in short order realizing this was a little bit much for me to be walking this length and by the time I got to the cardiac ward I was wiped out and I want, went around the corner and one of the nurses saw me and she says, oh father you're back and oh and you brought flowers from one of our, for one of our patients and I said actually no these are flowers for all of you and I put them on their counter, you know, on the nurse's stand, station. You know, again, showing my appreciation, but more importantly, being Christ in their midst, loving them, loving them. And that's, to me, Orthodox Christianity in work, in, in, in reality. It's how, how we're, it's supposed to be. And I'm going to touch on for, for a moment here the subject of abortion. I have had the experience as a, as a confessor of hearing countless women, and especially if they are from Eastern Europe and Russia. I, I had, I've had more than one woman confess having had seven abortions. And then now they're Orthodox. You know, they've embraced their faith. And they're, and they're devastated thinking of what they've done. And, and of course, my role as the, as the spiritual therapist in the hospital is, is, is to bring them peace by bringing them Christ's absolution. And knowing that they're truly repentant by their tears. But, you know, it's like we can't change society by force. But we have to follow the example of St. Seraphim of Sarov by changing ourselves. Change begins with me. It has to begin with me. If we want to change the world, it has to begin with ourselves. I have to be different. I have to love everyone equally. I had a young man from out of state come to confession to me recently. And he had, I think, uh, I've been told it's because people sense in my blogs, in my podcasts, uh, where I stand on lots of things and how, uh, and, th and they feel safe knowing that I'm not going to judge them. So I've heard confessions from people over the years that I never even dreamed people could do. I mean, my gosh. But, I, but I, I'm always filled with joy no matter what I hear, knowing that, that the angels and the saints in heaven are rejoicing when they hear a good confession. And this young man, who had only been Orthodox for a few years, shared with me that he had, in his desire to deepen his faith, had, had shared with his priest that he was struggling with same-sex attraction. And the response was, well, you can no longer come into the altar and serve, and I'm banning you from communion. Mm -hmm. 
And when he shared this, the grief that he felt, he said, what do I do, Father? He says, I've discovered orthodoxy. It's what I need. It's what I want. But I feel like I can't be here now because I'm not wanted. And I said, just from now on, be more, select, better, uh, uh, more selective on who you have as a confessor. You don't have to have him as your confessor. And just, I said, if you have a confessor that tells your priest he's blessed to go to communion, then you go to communion. And I'm, it's amazing. I have a blessing from my archbishop to hear confessions over the phone and give absolution over the phone. It's a rare thing, but I have that blessing. What I prefer to do is on Skype, because then I can see the person, and I can see their face, and I can see their reaction when they see my hand go up and bless them. I always do that in private. I don't want to be out in public somewhere and people are seeing me bless them. <laughs> That would be a little weird. So I don't know how much time we have. 8.30. 8.30, okay, there we are. There's more tomorrow, I think, yes. <laughs> depending on God's will. <laughs> so God bless you. And it's a, just a joy to see you, all of you. And one of the things that is a big joy for me when I do this, these kinds of travels is uh, it's a great comfort to see Orthodox Christianity thriving in our nation. Sometimes not as much as we'd like to see it thrive, but it's a good start. And I especially love to see young people. There's not enough of you. So I, I'm, I'm excusing that as this is a Friday night. But, but I would like to see all of you encourage any young people uh, to be here tomorrow. Uh, because you're the future. And remember this. Always be very nice to your to young people fathers because you never know you might live long enough to have them as your bishop and he will remember <laughs>